So welcome everybody. We have a really interesting topic today. Um, it, this is a part of, as you know, a webinar, uh, part of the GPE Summit. Uh, so this is one of the side events and uh, welcome. I'm glad you found us. I know it's a, a little bit hard sometimes to find the side events, but I'm glad you found us. And uh, um, the, uh, the topic today is about uh, positive youth development and soft skills, especially as they relate to education and the role that education can play um, with regard to this topic. Next slide, please. So before we jump into the specific topic, just a very quick background on um, Youth Power to Learning and Evaluation, which is uh, the project that is uh, sponsoring or is organizing uh, the event today. So uh, Youth Power to Learning and Evaluation is a USAID funded project. And um, it's uh, focused on positive youth development. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. And uh, uh, it provides practitioners or it aims to provide practitioners with information, tools, and resources that they need to develop high quality, impactful, and sustainable youth programs. And in particular, it's also directed at youth uh, themselves and providing them with what uh, they need to be good change makers. And so it has a, a research component, a learning network component, which is also what this is a part of, the two websites, youthpower.org and youthlead.org, and then a, a rapid response technical support for USAID. And so um, our speakers today are uh, on the very left, you can see myself. Uh, and then we are very pleased to have uh, Albina. Uh, she is one of our community of practice co-champions for the higher education and evidence and transformation uh, community of practice. And she's calling in from, Kaz oh, she's, uh, from Kazakhstan and joining us. Uh, we have Heather Simpson, who is the chief program officer uh, at Room to Read and delighted to have her join us. And then Eric Berktold, who is uh, the executive director at the Office of Global Projects at the U University of Arizona, and has actually been directly connected to youth power projects in um, uh, Indonesia previously. And then Katie Pons, who is our KM and online communities manager at uh, Youth Power to Learning and Evaluation, who is helping us with the webinar today and uh, also with the slides. So um, welcome everybody. And uh, the agenda for today is uh, we'll take a quick look at what, why positive youth development and what it is what it means with regard to education, and then uh, how soft skills are connected with positive youth development. Um, and then we'll go into some uh, examples. So the first example is going to be uh, from Albina, who is going to talk about uh, her personal story with regard to soft skills. Then we'll have uh, Heather, uh, talk about the girls' education program that Room to Read has implemented. And then uh, Eric is going to present a PYD example from Indonesia. So it's a, a rich um, a range of, of different examples and experiences. Next slide, please. Uh, so just with regard to why USAID even started to uh, focus on youth, you know, none of these uh, items are going to be a surprise for you. Uh, the, the number of youth that are not in education or employment or training, the unemployment situation, the violence situation, um, also uh, health issues with regard to adolescents uh, and especially in low and middle income countries. And then also with regard to the future of work, two thirds uh, of jobs in developing in the developing world are susceptible to automation and uh, even more basically job losses. So all of that has led USA to really focus on uh, youth and then 
looking at it in a positive youth development uh, frame. And so, um, next slide, please. And so what does positive youth development mean? Uh, USAID is defining it, or kind of the project and, and others are defining it as <clears throat> having kind of four pillars. One is providing youth with the assets that they need, giving them agency, therefore allowing them to leverage those assets and giving them the ability to contribute to positive change for themselves and their community, and also being surrounded by an enabling environment. Next slide. Uh, and so this approach uh, has definitely been shown as being effective. Uh, there was a systematic review that the Youth Power Project did uh, a few years ago that looked at positive youth development and workforce development. And uh, it has shown that uh, applying a PYD approach in these programs has had an impact. Um, it has led to increases in formal and self-employment. Uh, <clears throat> It has shown clear increase in the assets and earnings uh, of the participants in those programs. It has led to increased savings, increased duration of employment and work experience. Um, and it has also actually shown effects in uh, health uh, programs. And so even though the program may have been focused on workforce development, some of the um, skills that the youth have learned have then also had uh, kind of side effects that were health related. And when I'm talking about the soft skills, some of these things will become uh, clearer. Next slide, please. So um, I mentioned that, you know, there are these four pillars or domains, assets, agency and contribution. But when looking at positive youth development, it also makes sense to dig a little deeper especially when uh, looking at the education sector. So there is uh, the component, so there's seven key features. One of them is the skill building aspect. So that's what's connected with the assets and the agency. Um, but then there's also youth engagement. Uh, there's, especially for the enabling environment, very important features, healthy relationships and bonding belonging and mem membership, positive norms and expectations, safe spaces, and then access to age appropriate and youth friendly services. So these have been identified as the seven key features for positive youth development programs. And so um, you can already, you know, so when we are applying that to an education sector, and this is just a, a kind of a very quick look, um, we did a, a brainstorming with a small group and, and on the in the right hand column, you can see how the PYD features could be applied in an education setting. And so, for example, the skill building one, obviously building assets by embedding soft skills in in specific existing courses. Um, for the agency, it could be funding student-led clubs. It could be uh, giving youth a voice in the decision-making. With regards to contribution, uh, depending on the level of, uh, of the education, it could be uh, providing community outreach opportunities for the students. It could be building a strong network of companies and organizations for research activities. And then with regard to, uh, for example, belonging in membership, it could be peer-to-peer -peer partnering for newcomers at universities. So there are very specific activities that can fit into each of these features. And then the star uh, on this chart also indicate kind of the clear connection between these features, but also how they are relevant to soft skills and where they are connected to soft skills. Obviously under the asset and skill building, there can be specific courses that are related to soft skills. But then when you go further down, belonging and membership is a clear uh, kind of component of um, 
uh, and the healthy relationships, clear components of the soft skills. So the, it's, uh, uh, what I wanted to show is just that connection between the PYD features and how important it is to uh, uh, relate that also to soft skills. Next slide, please. And so uh, on the soft skills, uh, there was an, a very interesting study that Youth Power Action did, um, uh, I think about three years ago. And it looked at key soft skills in three different environments, workforce success, violence prevention, and sexual and reproductive health. And they looked at which features uh, were required in order to have successful programs in these three areas. And then they looked at the overlap between the three different areas to look at which soft skills were important in, let's say, workforce success, but at the same time uh, overlapped with violence prevention success. And so you can see that the, the blue box in the middle, positive self-concept, self-control, and higher order thinking skills has had a positive effects in all three areas. And then you see that there are some that are particularly related just to one of those areas or two of those areas. And so that's also kind of one of the reasons why implementing a soft skills program in one area can actually have very positive effects also uh, either for violence prevention, if for example, it's a workforce program, it can have uh, positive effects with regard to violence prevention, as well as sexual and repro uh, reproductive health uh, effects. Um, next slide, please. So uh, soft skills has also been an, an this one refers to life skills, but it has also been very recently recognized uh, again, I mean, not, not new, but the ILO has just recently also referenced it in a, um, a publication where they were talking about post COVID situation and uh, where they were talking about the need for upskilling and the, some of the key skills that they included there was higher cognitive skills, social and emotional skills, and adaptability and resilience. So obviously um, in these core skills that they've highlighted as how important they are in this, uh, especially post COVID environment, soft skills uh, are key to this. Um, and just to mention soft skills sometimes are referred to as life skills. Uh, it's not ex exactly always the same definition and sometimes they're also called uh, socio-emotional skills. So there is an overlap. There are also some differences, but uh, principally they're, they're very much almost the same and, and definitely related. Next slide. So um, we've talked about the importance of soft skills and, and why you know, the employers are looking for them or, or that employers are looking for them. Uh, but there's definitely also gaps. And so when um, we are looking at some of the reasons of why these gaps exist, obviously uh, we'll talk a little bit about the gap from a programming perspective of why, you know, what is missing in the education sector, but it's also sometimes an expectations gap. So this chart uh, is based on a study that EDC did a few years ago, and they looked, they asked youth what they thought um, the, the blue bar is what they thought they had in terms of soft skills. The yellow bar shows what they thought a successful um, young person that is looking for a job should have. And then the black bar is the, uh, the expectations that the employers have with regard to those skills. And so you can see that in all of these areas, there is a gap definitely between what the youth thinks they have um, in terms of their skills, but uh, especially even between what they feel they should have and what the employers actually are expecting. So that gap is, is uh, uh, an expectations gap. Next slide, please. 
Um, and so um, one, uh, and so we will be talking about what can be done to fill both uh, the, the uh, skills development, but also uh, we will have an example of, uh, from Albina, who is going to talk about her own uh, experience and the learnings that she had with regard to one of the soft skills and uh, that can show kind of a path of how soft skills are often developed. So with that, let me hand it over to Albin. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Albina, I'm from Kazakhstan and currently I'm a graduate student at UCL um, on Chivning Scholarship. So I'm studying education and development. And my uh, dissertation topic is um, specifically about skills development, so-called 21st century skills development, and how education policy in Kazakhstan conceptualizes the skills in relation mainly to decent employment. So today we saw that um, telling personal stories is a much more interesting to many people, and actually it can show how in reality uh, some policies are implemented maybe. So um, this is my photo and why I put this puzzle, because for me, skills development, it's uh, ongoing life process and it really comes from different parts of your life. It's not only formal education, but also non-formal setting like family. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I, I tried to put some photos because I think people like photos and um, as you can see, I have selected three skills, a communication, collaboration, and leadership. Uh, as we know, uh, in, uh, at the moment, there are many kind of terminology about those skills. As Maria said, sometimes they're called um, 21st century skills. Sometimes we call them transversal competences or um, hard and soft skills. So, uh, and there are different lists of them. For me, these three uh, key skills, they are kind of mentioned everywhere in different frameworks. And for me, they are kind of ones I could um, kind of specifically perhaps tell my story about. Uh, so you see three dots, it's kind of my journey. And it started from family and schools. So the way I developed my communication skills, my collaboration and leadership, it started from my school, kindergarten, and I would say a family. Uh, I'm from Central Asia, it's Kazakhstan, it's post-Soviet um, uh, kind of developing uh, upper middle income context at the moment. And so I had um, more, I grew up when there was first years of independence of my country. So uh, it was mainly a uh, centralized Soviet style setting. Uh, the, now I reflect uh, as, as an educational practitioner that it was mainly a uh, road learning focused on memorization, but we had the chance, as you can see from photo to foster our communication, presentation skills, teamwork by engaging in concerts. So in this photo in a like wedding dress, I was a kind of MC, I think it's this word in English, when you lead the concert kind of performances uh, and it helps you to develop the skills of kind of uh, presenting, communicating to the audience with my uh, peers and later, to the left, there is a photo of me uh, engaging in debate club. Uh, every school and university in Kazakhstan, mainly uh, not all of them, but majority has small uh, theater clubs, debates where anyone can come and join and develop the skills. Uh, but it's not mainly informal curriculum that lets you develop the skills. It's, I would say, extracurricular activities. And some very proactive teachers, we had amazing English teacher who, would, um, who set this theater where we could uh, put different uh, like Hamlet performances. And later, you see there is a point university. So I was lucky to get scholarship to study in a very uh, leading university in my country um, at bachelor master's degree. It's Western style with English teaching um, curriculum. So I was lucky, I would, uh, as I said, because we had, I had the chance to meet international teachers. So it developed my intercul intercultural communication skills. Uh, also, uh, later, um, 
I, I would add job setting because I think soft skills they are not only developed at family, schools, university, but also job helps to young professional to, to develop the skills. And as you can see from my photo, it's my first um, business trip to the UK. I was working at British Council as education projects manager. So I was um, lucky also to have amazing colleagues from all over the world. And they taught me how to write emails professionally, how to set up presentations, write policy briefs. So it comes from practice. And my last point uh, from my journey is at the moment, I'm all, uh, almost uh, hopefully graduating from my master's degree at um, UCL, it's leading UK university. And first, to be honest, I struggled a lot when I started my studies because uh, as my tutor said, you have amazing, uh, like you described everything in your SS because we have mainly SS as the grading assignment. So it's not tests I, I got used to, like high, high stake tests, memorization, multiple choice. It was mainly production skills. So, but they asked me, okay, you read a lot, you described a lot, but so what? So where is kind of your voice? Where is, um, how I would say, critical writing, thinking? So for me, it was a challenge. And thanks to academic writing centers help, thanks to personal tutor, which university provides us. And of course, it was COVID time. Everyone knows it was online uh, studying. And for me, all this uh, environment was a kind of enabling environment. And I wish our universities in Kazakhstan would have such support systems like academic writing center, personal tutors, because not all of them have them. And lastly, I would say that um, at the moment, uh, which is great news, my country is moving to competence skills-based curriculum. So they started doing it from schools. And when I look at policy papers, I see that they recognize the power of soft skills. But the, my last concern is, will it be implemented in reality? Because they lack uh, not only definition of skills, but how they will um, assess them because assessment, as everyone knows, is critical and how the skills will be progressed at your school, university, not just manifesting like we need the skills like critical thinking, ICT, communication, but uh, I hope it will be kind of chance for Kazakhstani youth and anyone in Central Asia to develop the skills in a real setting because at the moment it's manifested at policy level. So thank you. Thank you, Albina. That's uh, fabulous. I love your story. And, and I think it's just such a great example of soft skills and positive youth development. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, the, the policy decision, or the, at least it's, it's a step forward, as you said, the implementation may not be going far enough or not quick enough. Uh, but I think it's at least a, a step in the right direction. And it shows, you know, kind of how important that the enabling environment is to enable the whole change throughout the country and especially system-wide change. And uh, I think your story is a perfect introduction to what Heather is going to tell us about um, what, uh, what their program does. As you said, Albina, in your case, you did a lot of that through extracurricular activities, through your own initiative, finding things and, and I think Heather is telling us how some of the things can actually be implemented system-wide. So over to you, Heather. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Albina. Um, Room to Read um, envisions a world where all children and youth can pursue quality education that prepares them to be fulfilled and make positive change in the world. Um, and we do believe that education is the solution to the world's challenges. Room to Read has been working for a bit over 20 years now in about 20 different countries. Um, and some of these slides have additional details that, that you can peruse in a little bit more um, leisurely time. I'll just reference some of them. I'm going to focus today on what Room to Read does in our girls' education program with adolescent girls with what we call life skills, which maps um, to some degree to the soft skills, the 21st century skills that both Maria and Albina have um, referenced. Next slide, please. Our adolescent girls program 
for the first decade or so of Room to Read's work, we were doing a range of activities with adolescent girls, trying to keep them in school. Um, and we recognized that there were a lot of gaps in life skills curriculum, life skills support in many different ministries of education school system around the world. And it was a role and an expertise that Room to Read could bring to the education space that wasn't being addressed um, as strongly as possible in some areas. So Room to Read's adolescent girl programming does focus on life skills curriculum, mentoring, family school community engagement and material support. Next slide, please. And I'll, I'll touch mainly on the life skills briefly today. Um, and this is a slide to give you a little bit more detail about how we've constructed and, and organized our program. Our life skills curriculum is scaffolded. It's age appropriate. Um, we have curriculum from roughly grade six through grade 12. In some countries, we start as young as grade five um, up to grade 12, depending on how the ministry has organized their um, age group or their um, school system. Next slide, please. And the life skills curriculum that we have focus on these 10 key skills. And you can see some overlap again with what, what Maria mentioned with the ILO, framework and um, we based our framework on what UNICEF and UNESCO had been doing. Um, so uh, again, a lot of overlap and, and similar to what Albina mentioned, communication, collaboration, leadership, these all come to bear in the life skills curriculum. Next slide, please. Um, here's a, a sample session from a grade six activity that um, we do with our curriculum. Again, I'll let you take a little bit time outside of the session to peruse. Uh, next slide. And, and even during this global pandemic, we recognized that a lot of the adolescent girls were not able to, to come together with teachers, come together with room to read social mobilizers or with their peers, where a lot of this life skills learning traditionally has happened with peer groups, with teachers, with facilitators. Um, so during this global pandemic, we, we did pivot um, and developed hard copy life skills worksheets and newsletters for girls that touched on these um, themes and topics. We also broadcast um, life skills lessons over the TV and online through video, um, as well as audio instruction over radio broadcasts and podcasts as well that are available online. And also a, a really important component during this pandemic has been phone calls with girls for mentoring and to discuss some of the life skills topics. So next slide, I wanna just briefly mention again, as Maria mentioned, we're really, Room Treat is very um, uh, cognizant that we want to support the system to improve supports for girls' education. Room Treat alone can't do this. GPE alone can't do all of this. We all together need to work together. And um, Room to Read is working with ministries of education primarily as a system and, and adapting our um, activities into teacher training, into curriculum that can be applied within schools, um, also working with school management, school leadership to integrate some of these components um, and to, to share some of the evidence we're building with our own programming directly with girls and supporting the system to integrate aspects of this into the, the bigger scale system. Next slide. And we do, um, as Albina mentioned, it's really important to measure and to collect data and to really learn as an organization. Again, as an, as an implementing organization, one of the key things we can do with the sector is to develop evidence of what works and to share those insights more broadly. Um, and we do this through a risk and response um, set of data that we collect on an ongoing basis with the girls. We are doing life skills assessment work where we're measuring life skills outcomes, as well as doing surveys with alumna to, to see what they're doing one year out, five years out, ultimately 10 years out um, after they exit the program. Next slide. 
uh, and I'll skip this one. Next slide. Um, I, just as a highlight from our alumni survey um, with our data collection more recently, one year after graduation, you can see the, the blue represents how many, what percentage of the girls were enrolled in tertiary education or uh, vocational education. They were continuing their education beyond upper secondary. Um, the green represents the percentage of the girls who were um, enroll, enrolled in some sort of education as well as employed. And the yellow um, are girls who had gainful employed um, jobs. Um, and then the gray are those who were neither enrolled in some form of education or employed to, in, in a non-exploitive um, uh, job. And then five years after graduation, you can see that percentage of girls who were both continuing their education and gainfully employed is growing. Um, and um, we're, we, we remain committed to collecting these types of data to see what the longer term impacts are. And then a couple final slides I'll breeze through. Uh, next slide. Room to Read was um, we really appreciated the opportunity to engage on a uh, randomized control trial study where we were the implementing organization and then partners from JPAL, from American University, University of Illinois Chicago and Dartmouth College um, conducted the randomized control study on grades six and seven um, of the life skills curriculum programming to see what kind of impacts that curriculum was having. And final slide, um, or I think there's two more, but we did see a significant impact in lowering the dropout rates um, as well as a significant impact in grade progression. Um, and final slide, um, thank you. Uh, we also saw some significant changes, again, with just two years of, of life skills curriculum program, which is generally a seven year program. But in those first two years, we did see significant gains in social emotional support, empowerment, future planning and gender norms and and in life skills such as decision making, relationship building and creative problem solving. So with that, I will um, pause and hand it over to uh, Maria once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. This is, uh, it's just so fabulous to see these programs implemented at scale um, and, uh, and to see the, you know, the importance and, and the effect uh, that uh, you've had and that the way in which you have been able to measure the impact. I think it's really wonderful. So uh, congratulations. Um, and uh, our next uh, presentation is taking a kind of broader, again, PYD approach, uh, uh, but also with, soft, with a soft skills focus. And I'm handing it over to Eric for an example from Indonesia. Thanks, Maria. And Hello, everyone. I'm so I'm uh, Eric Bergfeld. I'm the executive director of the uh, Office of Global Projects at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And um, I'm also a former chief of party of a USAID youth power project in Indonesia that was called Mitra Kunci. So I'm talking today about Indonesia. Um, and if you could start the next slide. So in the higher education um, context in Indonesia, um, you know, you have common problems, I think, that, that a lot of countries face um, in university education that is, is very classroom based um, and, and theoretical. And so students feel like they're graduating without the skills they need for the workplace. And of course, employers are saying they don't have the skills um, that they need uh, for, for employment. Um, so uh, part of that is that you know, the sort of practical or experiential learning um, modalities are not counted towards the degree program, of course, so universities don't often include them in their curriculum and, um, and then students don't pursue those necessarily because they're, they're not getting credit for them. Um, not in all cases, but in, in many cases. Um, and I mentioned that, you know, the, the, when they graduate, there's this skills mismatch uh, between employers' needs and, and what, the, what the youth have uh, upon graduation. And that leads to a higher than 
uh, should be um, unemployment rate. Um, so, you know, in some of the tracer studies, we see that after two years, about 65% of the students have employment, um, formal employment, and then a certain percentage of them have self-employment. Um, but the overall employment rate is, is higher than it should be coming out of the university system. So next slide, please. Um, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, this kind of idea of enabling environment. Um, and, and this is kind of a, a policy that the government of Indonesia put together um, recently. It's about a year old. Um, and the idea <clears throat> of this campus uh, Merdeka or Freedom Campus, independent campus, was to give universities um, a, allow them to be more autonomous, independent, and innovative in, in how they approach the skill building um, component of, of education. Um, and, and that would give, and that, we'll talk a little bit about what those components are in a second, but <clears throat> the, um, the idea is so, so that they, they can develop these programs that, that students can get credit for, for taking, for doing internships and apprenticeships and practical sort of learning um, programs. And so, you know, universities can, can um, develop those programs. And next slide. So I hope you can read this, um, but this comes from the uh, kind of guidebook around this uh, policy program. And it sort of identifies um, eight components. So I'll just read those quickly if you can't read them, but the eight kind of skills development um, components are, are internships, independent study, student exchanges, uh, teaching in school, of course, um, research, uh, humanitarian projects, entrepreneurship activities and village development or community service. So those are, are sort of programs that have been identified as, as areas where um, universities and students can get that kind of practical learning. Um, so next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the component called village development or student community service, um, which uh, when I, on the Youth Power Project, uh, we were involved in developing a entrepreneurship themed community service program um, that, so that contributed, I think, to this overall goal. Um, so this student service program, uh, KKN or KKN um, in Indonesia, is something that um, most universities um, have and is uh, required for our many students between the third and fourth years. Um, so students develop these and they have sort of themes and they can be basic community service or they can be clean up the, the river, the polluted river, or you know, in our case, it was an entrepreneurship themed um, student service program. And the idea is that you get some classroom based training, but then you put students into you know, cohorts of 10 to 20 with faculty and, um, and, and so they design and they go into the community assess needs um, and then they design programs or activities to meet those needs, interacting with people in the community um, for usually four to six weeks um, in, in a local uh, area. Um, so for the program that we developed around entrepreneurship, uh, the idea was to have students use sort of a, a business canvas or, or assessment tool to go around and see what small and medium enterprises existed in those communities speak with them, try to find ways to support um, their business needs. Um, so it was an opportunity for them to learn and engage and get practical experience. Um, and so we developed the program the universities had funding and they ran the program on their own. So um, it was able to sort of reach some kind of scale without a huge investment from USAID because uh, the program already existed. The government of Indonesia was supporting it and universities had funding for it. So just a small example um, of, of students that responded to the tracer study that was recently conducted, about 28% reported that they had uh, formal or, or self-employment. Um, and this is within, I think, three months of graduation. So it's not a huge, long period of time, um, but showing some, some positive success there, I think, with, with the outcomes of that program. Um, next slide, please. So just to talk a little bit more about how PYD fits in. And I should, should say that uh, initially, 
you know, Indonesians don't really under, know the concept of PYD. Um, it's not something that's commonly used there. Um, but when you start talking about what are the components of PYD, people always say, yes, we do all of that. Um, we're doing that in our programs. And so um, I think it's just, it's not a purposeful use of the program, um, I mean, the approach, but it is uh, being implemented in different ways. So for this particular uh, program on entrepreneurship, um, one of the things we did was instead of having the faculties, you know, who are basically one faculty for 100 students, so they'll have five cohorts of 10 to 20 per faculty member meant to oversee this program um, and teach the courses and so on. So what we said is, well, why not have students facilitate some of these training sessions and serve as sort of mentors for the other students that are going through the program? And that'll give them an opportunity to lead and be part of it. And that really was successful because the youth had brought a lot of energy and enthusiasm to the program. And it also took the pressure off the, the, the faculty running the program. Um, so youth also, we, we gave, got them engaged in sort of telling the stories um, and, sh and, and sharing it through social media and through other forums so that, you know, they, um, became more active in, in, in the communication of what was going on because previously students would go out and, and do the community service and then you wouldn't hear what happened, what was the result, what was their experience like, um, and, and that information was, was a little bit lost. Um, and so in Indonesia, uh, what they, they often refer to this kind of learning as sort of learning at, by doing or transformational learning. Um, and it was really, um, in this case, helping them to develop skills as entrepreneurs that they could use either in running their own business or oftentimes those skills you know, were, were useful in the formal employment. And then just lastly on the, on the students that uh, an example from a university of Surrey Kanchana. Um, so they worked with um, you know, you know, businesses that were doing um, hydroponics and, and sort of nurseries and, and growing plants. Um, and so they had some initial investment and, and then from that initial investment, they were able to generate some profit. So you see how their engagement with that business resulted in a positive outcome for that business and they learned from that. So, you know, multiple benefits from that. Um, I don't know if I have a next slide, let's see. <laughs> That's it for me, thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh... This is a great example again of what kind of government action uh, can do uh, and, uh, and to see that governments are now starting to recognize the need for some of these skills and, and, uh, and many of these uh, soft skills are actually developed hands-on rather than sitting in the classroom and, and you know, listening to a lecturer. Um, so, uh, you know, I hope that these, uh, these examples have shown, you know, the importance of PYD and combining them with soft skills uh, to really help youth achieve their full potential. Uh, with that, we will start um, to answer some of your questions. And I will start with uh, the last question and it's connected to another question that was uh, mentioned earlier. And I'll ask Heather to also chime in. So uh, the question is, um, you presented a slide with uh, ideas on applying PYD to education organizations. What level were those ideas intended for? And then uh, Heather also presented a slide with different ideas for different grade levels. And the question for both of us is, how would you think about which soft skills are most important to develop at the secondary school level? And how to suggest integrating or adapting them uh, when many students are laser focused on earning high academic marks uh, to enable their progress into higher education? Uh, fabulous question uh, and we'll probably need another hour to respond fully to it but we'll start uh, so just kind of my answer is, is a faster one with regard to the table uh, the initial table was developed uh, primarily with uh, um, the uh, with higher education in mind 
and then uh, we did add a few examples that were looking more at at secondary education so it wasn't specific to one or the other but it probably has more of a higher education slant to it um, and then with regard to kind of the secondary school level i'll um, let heather talk about that Thanks, Marianne. Thanks for the question. It's a fantastic one. So Room to Read works with um, lower secondary as well as upper secondary. And we've scaffolded our life skills curriculum to be developmentally appropriate for those different grade levels and ages. Um, for the lower secondary, so roughly grades six through nine in many systems, we have about 15 to 16 sessions per academic year with those students. And then with the upper secondary grades 10 through 12, we do recognize there's less time that those girls have for sort of um, things beyond their academic studies. So we have five sessions per year for those girls. Again, a lot of these are focused on um, skills that help them become more efficient in their academic studies to, to time manage, to, to negotiate with their families, to have more time to dedicate to academics and things like that. So we, we actually have seen pretty consistently across the board, the girls expressing um, the, the power of, of having the opportunity to develop these life skills in sort of partnership with their academic studies as well. Thank you, Heather. Um, I know there's a, a, there was a question early on um, and that was from Yolande to Albina. Uh, how can universities in non-Western contexts adjust to cater to the skills that you mentioned? Yeah, I think uh, the three questions uh, from Joy, Regan, and Yolande, they kind of um, are related because people asking about developing context specifically, because as we know, context matters in our development uh, work. And they ask what kind of skills people interested, uh, uh, what, what kind of skills are important, and how I think um, stakeholders like families, Joe mentioned, and Yolanda mentions higher education could support young people in, in developing the skills. So it's kind of joint answer <laughs> to three questions. And I think I can start and maybe Heather, Eric, uh, Maria could add. Um, we have amazing panel today from different perspectives. So from my perspective and from research I'm currently doing, uh, at the moment, uh, existing frameworks for soft skills development, they are mainly informed by human capital theory. So especially, if, for example, in developing contexts. So they push you to produce the skills to be, in, uh, to, to be kind of adapting to new industry for zero, to be productive, to you know, kind of innovate so that your country could be competitive from economic growth. While actually I feel young people need the skills development to be more capable to have, uh, to live the life they value. So it, it should not only expand our money, but it should expand our opportunities, capabilities. So in developing country, it depends from which country you are from. And for example, for some countries, critical thinking skill, it's very important. And it should be developed, but not in relation to being more productive, but to be, to be able to question social injustice, uh, which is happening in your country, to be able to ask um, kind of transformative questions, I would say. And second skill, for example, creativity, it should not only be to be a kind of technological entrepreneur, but to be able to express myself in artistic form, to be able to develop myself as a person. And I think family and universities, they are really enabling environment. They should work together because in my country, universities separate them from parents. And why don't they invite them? Why it's not kind of uh, in many European countries when they open doors events, and there are, as I said, academic writing centers, career centers. We have them on paper, but they don't in reality develop your skills. I mean, you feel you, you might feel lonely. So you need this systemic support from university, like you know, like ecosystem. 
uh, and it should be adapted to your needs because we, do, we shouldn't assume all students entering the same level the university they come from different backgrounds as as my mother said don't um, confuse your start from with someone's middle like positions different so universities should do targeted help they should look at my needs as a person not like uh, robots i don't know employ employability you know um, indicator increases but look at what i need so i think it should be targeted thank you thank you albina um i may jump in briefly and perhaps heather or eric if you have any other thoughts i i think what um uh, one of the things I want to mention is that uh, because it relates, I think, to a question that Amy had uh, also asked earlier and somebody else in terms of the, the balance between what the students are currently focused on with regard to the results, you know, which is reading and, and math and, you know, having the, the perfect scores so that they can actually enter the universities. And this, the soft skills kind of might sound like something additional uh, that, um, you know, they will need to learn and how can they balance those things. And, and I think it is um, a challenge. One of the things we're definitely not saying is that reading and math is not important. Uh, I think what we're trying to say is that having the soft skills will actually make it easier for the children to learn reading and math and actually express themselves successfully, for example, um, when they're entering exams, et cetera. So I think those are, uh, they, they are difficult and challenging balances. And I think the other thing that uh, these examples have shown is that unless the change is system-wide, it will be difficult to do that balancing act because if the, universities are rewarded for only focusing on one thing, that's what they are going to focus on. Whereas if the government recognizes that there is a need uh, for broader skills, then over time, I do think that um, that change can actually happen. Um, and measuring is definitely a challenge. I don't know, Heather, if you want to talk a little bit about kind of measuring and, and I know that Room to Read has done an amazing uh, job in terms of developing tools that help with measuring soft skills. Thanks, yeah, I, I mean, Room to Read does focus on foundational learning with younger children, making sure they become literate so they can become lifelong learners. And for these adolescents, these life skills, these soft skills are actually foundational learning skills that can apply to science and math and, and history and all of that. So things such as critical thinking, persistence, problem solving, we recognize that a lot of school systems weren't helping those really focus and develop. And yet, as those students develop them, their academic scores go up. They, they flourish more effectively in academics. So that's the type of data we're trying to develop to show that as children develop and learn and and strengthen these skills that they have that it's correlated with increased outcomes that that the ministries are already measuring so we also recognize there was a gap in what kind of tools can measure these life skills so we've partnered with groups like american institutes for research and and brookings institution and other folks to to really help us um develop some tools that can be contextualized and applied across different scenarios so we're it's still a work in progress it's not perfect if it was easy to measure life skills we would already have tools from decades ago um, but we will have some um, more materials that we can share more broadly and i'm happy to um, make sure that we get that to this this community of practice as well that's wonderful. Thank you, Heather. Um, Eric, do you have any additional thoughts? Yeah, I think um, for me, uh, and it's really about the experiential practical learning um, opportunities and, um, and, and having students be able to learn while doing something, working together, um, doing some kind of task, um, internship, uh, work experience. And I think 
um, that's the, the way that those soft skills are developed, um, especially, in, and not that the classroom is, is not uh, a place for that, but it's much harder to, of course, teach those practical skills there in the classroom. So that's what I would advocate for. And, and I think that's what I'm seeing Indonesia try to do. And so that's exciting. And I hope that program's uh, successful. Great, thank you. Um, Albina, any last thoughts from your perspective? <laughs> yeah, I'm turning into skills development expert with my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, I agree with Heather, Eric and Maria that skills, soft skills, they don't undermine the need for foundational skills. They just expand your kind of capability set, isn't it? They help you to live very kind of full life, productive, and the life you value as a global citizen to make better world for everyone. So I think today it was nice opportunity to have different expanded views, not only uh, kind of, uh, not only to job, uh, re job related, isn't it? So I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Albina. Um, with that, let me just switch to a few final slides that we are not going to present, but we will send them out uh, at the uh, at, uh, after the session to all of you, and uh, they would contain um, a lot of references. So we want to provide you with a lot of links related to positive youth development, related to soft skills. Uh, and we'll actually add in some of the links that were listed uh, in the chat today so that uh, we can we will update the ones that are already on the list here. Um, so you will be able to go back to some of them and hopefully find that uh, useful resources. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for our excellent speakers. Uh, thank you uh, for having shared your experiences and your programs. And thank you for all your uh, all your participants who have joined us. I hope you found it useful. And um, uh, I, I saw that several of you ended late and know that there is a problem with the time zone sometimes. So I apologize. We have uh, recorded the session and we'll share it with everybody who is registered so that you can still um, send us any questions by email afterwards. So thank you all and uh, have a good rest of your day. <laughs>